Beneath skies that sometimes dazzle like faceted sapphires or turquoises, that sometimes are molded of infernal, hot, noxious, and blinding sulfurs, beneath skies like streams of molten metals and crystals, which at times expose radiating, torrid solar disks, beneath the incessant and formidable streaming of every conceivable effect of light, in heavy, flaming, burning atmospheres that seem to be exhaled from fantastic furnaces, where gold and diamonds and similar gems are volatilized, there is the disquieting and disturbing display of a strange nature that is at once entirely realistic, and yet almost supernatural, of an excessive nature where everything, beings and things, shadows and lights, forms and colors, rears and rises up with a raging will to howl its own essential song in the most intense and fiercely high-pitched timbre, trees, twisted like giants in battle, proclaiming with the gestures of their gnarled, menacing arms, and with the tragic waving of their green manes, their indomitable power, the pride of their musculature, their blood-hot sap, their eternal defiance of hurricane, lightning, and malevolent nature, cypresses that expose their nightmarish, flame-like black silhouettes, mountains that arch their backs like mammoths or rhinoceri, white and pink and golden orchards, like the idealizing dreams of virgins, squatting, passionately contorted houses, in a like manner to beings who exult, who suffer, who think, stones, terrains, bushes, grassy fields, gardens, and rivers that seem sculpted out of unknown minerals, polished, glimmering, iridescent, enchanting, flaming landscapes, like the effervescence of multicolored enamels in some alchemist's diabolical crucible, foliage that seems of ancient bronze, of new copper, of spun glass, flower beds that appear less like flowers than opulent jewelry fashioned from rubies, agates, onyx, emeralds, corundums, crystal barrels, amethyst, and chalcedonies. It is the universal, mad and blinding coruscation of things. It is matter and all of nature frenetically contorted. Raised to the heights of exacerbation, it is form becoming nightmare, color becoming flame, lava and precious stone, light turning into conflagration, life into burning fever. Such is the impression left upon the retina when it first views the strange, intense, and feverish work of Vincent Van Gogh. So this rather long and undoubtedly run-on sentence debuted in the inaugural edition of the January 1890 Mercure de France, a recently resurrected Parisian Gazette and literary magazine seeking a spot among the fond de socle avant-garde. The opinion was penned by the arguably dashing Parisian poet, art critic, and aspiring symbolist Albert Aurier. His article would attempt to make two points, that the greatest living artist of the moment was a crazy Dutchman who'd cut off his ear for a prostitute seeking exile in a Provencal asylum, and two, like himself, the madman was a symbolist. We will dig into the various definitions of symbolist art, most notably Vincent's own, as we explore the likelihood that he painted a unique depiction of The Last Supper, famous in Western art by the likes of Tintoretto, El Greco, Van Gogh contemporary Fritz von Ude, and of course, this decaying mural in Milan. Arguably, which is why we're all gathered here today, we'll strive to determine whether Cafe Terrace at Night, originally owned by one Albert Aurier, hanging in plain sight for well over a century, is in fact Vincent's unique depiction of The Last Supper. <laughs> 